talk. So I will begin the SOLIDWORKS What's New presentation for 2017, 2018, because most of us are running 2016. I do want to start off with a few caveats. You do not have to go to 2018. With the upgrade of our license server and the upgrade of our data manager server to 2018, you can now run 17 or 18, but if you're on a project, you certainly want to make sure that the whole project is able to do it. For Project Loom, since they are in the middle of a transition to Anovia, they will not be able to transition into SOLIDWORKS 2018 until that uh, migration is finished, which should be in a couple of months. Um, other crews are able to do it. You definitely want to have a meeting inside your project and make sure everybody is okay with it as far as the vendors being able to upgrade and everyone on the team being able to upgrade. You need to move uh, lockstep. If one person upgrades and the rest don't, if he starts opening parts and saving them and he saves them as a 2018 file, only people with 2018 will be able to open those files. So do not be the person who decides to just upgrade on their own uh, because it can lead to major problems with your data as far as everybody being able to access it. You'll probably also want to be able to test the 2018 if you're going to go into it before you actually have the entire project go up to it. Okay, with that caveat, I'm going to get into what's new. You can find hours and hours of what's new in 17 and 18 on YouTube, believe me. I went through it last week. And a lot of it, since it's done by resellers and SOLIDWORKS, is marketing. They'll put in a lot of stuff that's new, but they're really trying to push you towards, uh, you know, things that you can buy or products that you haven't used before. I'm going to try and keep this presentation just to things that I think people here at X will be using in 2018. So without further ado, let me click on 2018 and start it up. One thing on 2018, the graphics has been upgraded to be able to work with a 4K monitor. Also, I've had a little bit more stability with 18 on Windows 10 than I did with 16. Since 18 was built really for Windows 10 and 16 was uh, more towards people that were on 7 or 8. One of the main things you'll notice whenever you start up SOLIDWORKS, you have this welcome page. If you do not want to see the welcome page, that's up to you. There's a do not show on startup down here in the lower left. But I've already gotten kind of used to it. It's nice. It shows you recent documents. You can open new documents from your templates here, existing files here, as well as recent folders you've been to. So it gives you a snapshot of, hey, right when you come into work, do you want to keep working on stuff that you've been doing recently? Or would you like to start a new design? It comes up automatically. Also, there's a spot here where you can go into the learning. You just need to get yourself a My SolidWorks login. And you can see different things like they have tutorials and what's new. They've always had these in the software. It's just an easy place to grab it now from this home page. All this stuff on the home page was usually up here. You would find um, things like tutorials and uh, manufacturers up here, but now you can also find it just by hitting this little button that looks like a house. It'll take you right back into it. So let me open up an assembly that I've been working on already. And as SOLIDWORKS begins to open it up, you're going to see something new come on the screen right in front of you. It's showing me how many components are opening and where it is in the process. Earlier, you would have had to look in the lower left-hand corner, see which files were opening up. If something was taking an especially long time, you really didn't have an idea of where it was in the process of opening the assembly. This hopefully will help you out, um, let you know how long it took earlier and how long it is expected to take this time around. Now that I've got the assembly open, let's take a look at some of the stuff that they've done to the user interface just to clear clutter for you. So in your feature manager tree, this looks like a typical feature manager tree where you've got a lot of information hanging off the back of your file name here, showing me the configurations and the design states that it is currently in. If 
I right click on my feature manager tree here and I go into the tree display, there's a couple of choices I can do here. One of them is the configuration name or the display state. We don't use a lot of configurations here at X. We do use display states from time to time, but if you're not using multiple configurations, that information is just cluttering up your tree. So if I check this on, you can see all these parts, they only have one single configuration. They only have one single display state. So there's no reason for it to tell me which config is active and which display state it's in, because it's the only choice it's got. Some other things in the feature manager tree, you'll see that I've got a lot of similar components, sub-assemblies and parts. I could create folders for these. A lot of people do try and keep things a little more cleanly here in their feature manager tree. But in 2018, there's another ability on the uh, tree display. And that is to group component instances. So you see my feature manager tree just got a lot shorter all of a sudden. What it's done is it's found these are all the same component just over and over again. So it grouped them into one spot. I can click here and access a particular instance, but it just groups anything. It's got the same file name and is in the same configuration. So you see if I open this assembly up, just quickly add a configuration to it. When I save that change, and rebuild, nothing's happened so far because these are the same configuration. But if I were to break one of them out to the other configuration, you'll see that now those are listed as separate items. So when it does that grouping, it's only doing grouping of parts that are the exact same part and using the exact same configuration. All right, so a lot of that had to do with you know, clutter in the feature manager tree. One more thing that they've made uh, very easy, a lot of times you'll have different things that are transparent and solid and you'd have to go in here and fiddle around with what you wanted transparent if you wanted to set the entire assembly to transparent. Now you can do it with just one click. You right click the top icon, you can set everything in the assembly to transparent right away if that's something that you're wanting to do. Some other things that have been added are on the Evaluate tab. So I've got Performance Evaluation, which is not new, but they've added more information. Usually we would get this information, which is basically just a count of how many parts, sub-assemblies you have inside the assembly, that sort of thing. It would give you some performance options, but now it gives you much more detailed performance options. How long did it take to open these files? So you can see here, the open time of the new helmet is taking the longest. Or if I go in here, the, the amount of graphic triangles. See a couple of parts that I have um, certainly have huge spikes on the graphics triangles. There's another tool that existed before called assembly visualization. It's a really nice tool for trying to figure out, you know, hunting for a particular thing inside of your assembly. Uh, I used this just last week to help somebody out find the heaviest part. They had something that was giving them a mass problem. So I can actually sort this by heaviest to lightest, and I can play around with where I start marking thing as heavy. Anything above this line will be blue, so visually I can see what are the heavy parts. Again, not new in 18. What is new is the fact that I can put that performance analysis in there. I could always do this stuff, add, you know, if I want, instead of searching for mass, I can search for volume, see which the biggest parts, what are the smallest parts. But with performance analysis, it'll give me a few more tabs with the open time. So I can sort it by which file takes the longest to open. You'll see there's the helmet getting flagged there. 
Which one takes the longest to rebuild? Or graphic triangles. So what's the difference in all of these? When you're talking about SOLIDWORKS performance, there's a couple of different ways you can take a hit as far as an assembly not performing up to its best. One thing is your load time. And that's what these uh, rebuild and open columns have to do with. You can find out why is this thing taking five minutes to open. You can see the individual part why that's uh, opening, taking a long time to open. The other thing is graphic triangles. So when SOLIDWORKS uh, creates the visual, the graphics on the screen, in the background, this isn't going to be a cylinder. It's actually going to be a series of triangles to make up the cylinder, the graphics of the cylinder, and then it shades it and smooths it and makes it look like the nice part that we're used to. But these graphic triangles are where you get into trouble with your performance after the file has been opened. Like if you're trying to do a section view or if you switch it to wireframe and the whole system just slows down to a crawl, probably going to be due to you having tons of graphic information in a particular part. With this visualization, not only can you get stuff to show up, you know, graphically as to what's going on, you can even open files from here. So let's take a look at this one that is the top problem with the graphics triangles. It's a vendor part, so I don't know if it needs this much information. The thing is, the, the good people at McMaster Car love putting details in here. So this is got the actual tapped holes tapped into the part, which is what is killing our triangles. When you look at this, SOLIDWORKS is going to have thousands of triangles for each one of these helixes. And so when you hit wireframe and you try to rotate this assembly, it's going to start locking up because it has to redraw all of those helixes every time you rotate this thing. So I guess people in McMaster Car have plenty of time on their hands because we're just going to use their data sheet. We're never going to make a detailed drawing off of this model that we got from them. So really not going to help us out. So I'm just going to go through here and find any helixes and suppress them, simplify this thing much more. So you remember it was at the top of the tree with 30,000 or some crazy amount of triangles that it used to have. I suppress those and now it's no longer at the top of the list. I've got some other part. And then again, that one's got helixes. This one's a little more um, realistic where I might want to have this level of detail, but definitely for tapped holes and things like that, um, that's a landmine anyways. Uh, when you are modeling stuff, don't model the threads. Just do a cosmetic thread. Like I said, the data sheet for McMaster car of that component doesn't have all that detail. It's just got a hole call out for the tap like it should. All right, so there's some new stuff as far as being able to get information from your assembly. I'm going to go to my assembly tab, and we've got our old friend, the insert component. They've sped this up. If you only have one file open, when I go to insert component, typically I would have had to hit the browse button. If I have anything open, it'll be listed here. If I don't have anything open, I have no choice but to hit the Browse button. So what SOLIDWORKS has done is if there's nothing open, if there's no list in that open documents, it'll automatically open up the browser for you so you can go find the file that you need. Uh, that's, that's minorly useful. Just saves you a couple seconds not having a click. But this next thing that I'm going to show you is truly revolutionary on 18. Um, so... You know, the choice of do we move to 18? This is one of the reasons why people like using it. There's something called interconnect that's in SOLIDWORKS now. They started it in 2017. It was pretty rudimentary, but it made a huge step in 2018 where I can bring in IGES or STEP files without translating them. I just bring them in directly into my SOLIDWORKS assembly. So that's the thing that changed in 18. In 17, 
they gave us the ability to bring in Creo files, Solid Edge files, Inventor. So other CAD systems, we can bring in their native files without having to translate them. We just drop them in natively. One of the, the sort of missteps that they did on 17 was EPDM couldn't really handle that. When you drop a step file or an IGES file, there's no problem because it's a single file. But if you're dropping in a Creo file or an Inventor file, anything like that, it's got external references. It's got an assembly, it's got components, sub-assemblies. They work the same way as a SOLIDWORKS external reference. In EPDM 2018, they've given you the ability to manage non-SOLIDWORKS CAD files. So you can drop in a Creo file, it'll have all the references. When you go to open that assembly uh, or put that assembly into a model, it'll know to grab the components with it. And if you make, if someone sends you files that have changed in Pro-E, you can write over the top of those that you have inside of your data manager, and it'll still keep all the references and it'll still keep the history. So huge step. Like in this instance, I'm going to bring in a step file. They open, drop it in, done. If I take a look at this file, it's going to have a little mark next to it. I don't know if you can see that on this tiny screen, but there's a little green arrow pointing to the left over that file. Since it is multi-body, it does show up as a sub-assembly. If it was just a single body, it would show up like it was a part. And you'll see that the only thing this part has in it is a whole other part. It just got a reference to that step file. If I try to um, edit this in any way, not really going to work for me because it's not a SOLIDWORKS file. It never gets translated. It is a, a native step file. So it is pointing to the step file. When you open this assembly, it's going to go looking for that step file wherever it was saved on your computer. Again, in EPDM 2018, you can check in step files and IGES files natively into your vault. That's fine. It will revision control them and do all the other things that you need to do with your files. You just don't need to translate them especially with step files that are multi-body. Uh, in the past, you would have to bring it in and then save it out as a part, maybe just as surfaces, things like that. A lot of rigmarole to get your files in there. Now at this point, it's much easier for me to um, make those changes. I can go in here and take a look at the external reference that it is looking at. I can point that external reference to other places just by editing the external reference. If someone replaces that step file or overwrites that step file, this will update with it. So it's a really huge step as far as translation goes. You don't really need to translate stuff anymore. You just put it in its native format and drop it into SOLIDWORKS, you'll be fine. Okay, so I actually want this PCB board inside of this sub-assembly. Um, I don't know if you remember this from the last What's New, but we've got this breadcrumb thing that allows us to see different levels of assembly. I can just open that sub-assembly right away. So I can make using uh, planes or faces or really anything I want to to mate this step file into place. Again, I didn't need to translate it. I just brought the step file in natively. And here we go, mating it just with, a, with the planes from the original. Front, right, and then top. OK, so now I've got that file in there. It is a little tough to see what the heck's going on inside of this thing. They've got something else that's new inside of, I think this was in 17, might be in 18, not sure, but section views. We could always do section views. You know, you wanna see what exactly is going on here. You can play around with what we need to see. The thing is, is that when it sections it, it sections everything. And I might wanna see a little bit of information not sectioned.
that's where this transparent uh, section comes from. If I start picking these items and say, okay, you'll see what it does is it'll section it and I can still leave the ghost behind of the stuff that I've sectioned. So you still get an idea of what the extents of the assembly is, even though you've sectioned it. So it's pretty cool. It will remember that when you turn off the section view, when you go back to it, it's still got those picks in the queue. So you just go back to it and you get the same section over and over again. All right, another thing on working with patterns. When you have a linear pattern or, or any pattern for that matter, you have the ability to skip instances. If anybody's ever used this, you're probably familiar with it. Uh, you turn it on and everything gets this little purple dot, which is a toggle on or off as to whether you want the pattern to use that example. You'll see I've got some of these toggled off. You can pick them individually, not new. What is new is the fact that I can do box selections here now. So I can pick a bunch of them, it'll turn them all off at once. Or if you pick a group, some of them are on or some of them are off, it'll toggle the ones that were on off and the ones that were off on. So it just gives you the ability to really um, quickly grab information. If you want to turn something on or off, it's pretty easy to do it now using this box selection. Okay. Back to this assembly. Oh, whoops, I wanted to open this part. There we go. There's another option that's been around for a while. You know that if you start a new sketch, typically it just leaves you in whatever view you were in. Um, some people like to look normal to their sketch at all times. If you're one of those people, there is an option, and there has been an option for a long time, to auto-rotate normal to view and this one says on sketch creation, but they've added and on sketch edit. So with this tool turned on, if I start a new sketch, I get to look straight down, true size and shape on that sketch plane automatically. So now if I draw anything, I know that I'm drawing um, it in regular spot. And so what's new is if I edit a sketch on something, it also takes me looking normal to that sketch right when I edit it. So again, it's a personal preference. If you like always looking straight down on your plane, there's a button for that. And where it was was in the options, sketch, auto rotate view, very first choice. Okay, back into this part. I'm going to close it out. I'm going to look for some recent files. I just press the R key. That's, again, nothing new. There again is that telling you how long it took before and how long it's going to take this time. You can choose not to show that on the assembly open. Uh, it'll still show up in the left lower left here where you can watch all the files load up, but it's just kind of nice because it shows you where it is in the process. So if you've got something that's sticking, um, you can see it more easily. Okay. I'm still on patterns. At the assembly level, you can do a linear pattern. Again, nothing new here.
And this happened earlier on my thing where I have lost my mouse. Uh, try it again. Okay. So for the component that I want to pattern, it's these two. And I'll bump this thing up quite a bit. Make sure it's headed in the right direction. OK. So right now, this is not new. I've been able to do this, but for this display stand that I'm putting together, the helmets are knocking on the steps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something where I can rotate the instances. What this allows you to do is you can pick an axis or a, a, a conical face, a cylindrical face, or a circular edge to say, okay, this is what we're going to rotate about. And I can rotate these things as they go up. As they're going up linearly, I can have them rotate to whatever uh, set value I want. So there we go. Make a little display stand with this thing twisting as it goes up. Something new in 18. You notice when I was trying to uh, type in the numbers for that, it showed a giant like calculator box. That is because I'm on a touch screen machine. So I can actually, I'm doing this with my finger. I'm just clicking on my screen and getting it all greasy, rotating this thing. So they did enable touch screen where I can zoom in by doing the spread or the pinch to zoom in, the spread to zoom out. So kind of like maps on your phone, when you want to zoom into some place, you just spread out and it'll start zooming in there. The other thing that they've done is they've uh, given you the ability, if you do have a touch screen, to uh, sketch using the touch screen. So far, I'm not very impressed with it. Um, I can show you what's going on here. So if I'm in a sketch and I just touch my screen, I can scribble whatever the heck I want on there. Um, there's different options as to how your um, sketcher is working, whether it's going to try and make a spline out of this, whether it's going to try and make lines and arcs out of it. Um, it does have some cool stuff, but... I've really had not much luck like trying to draw a slot or something like that. It's so aggravating, I should have just used a slot tool. So it's got a ways to go, but it's sort of something in the future. You can do more industrial design type of stuff just by uh, creating your um, sketch with a touch screen. One other thing you're going to notice in the sketcher right away is that right there. The fact that it is shading in the sketch. It will show isolated islands as darker. And you'll see that, you know, that'll get darker still. It keeps getting a gradient darker as you go in deeper and deeper to you know, how far you've gone. So I know a lot of people uh, do design in this way where they'll have like a master sketch or something and draw a lot of stuff. Um, it's nice because you can see what's going to extrude, what's going to be left behind. Another giant bonus is knowing whether or not you have a closed contour. So as I draw this shape, um, you know, I can squiggle around and I know right away from the shaded that I've connected the dots. If that thing doesn't go shaded, it means that you've missed it a little bit. Before, you weren't going to know you missed it until you tried to extrude it, and then you were wondering what happened. So it'll show you your contour in real time as you're sketching. Another thing that they've added with the multiple contour is if I hold the Alt key, I can pre-select a contour, and it'll just extrude that. 
So you can actually, while you're in the sketch, just pick a zone with the Alt key and say, this is what I want to extrude, and it ignores everything else in the sketch for you. Okay, let's take a look at an improved feature. I'm going to set this thing up first. Got a little line here. Break this face. Draw another line here. Actually, usually I use my mouse gestures to get lines, so I'll just do that, um, which I can break off here for a second, talk a little bit about uh, mouse gestures. If you haven't used them, try using them. Um, I, I say it all the time. I use them myself, and they're a great help just to get into whatever tools you want. Some people uh, didn't like using them just because they were a little hard to set up. They've made it much easier to set up. They've also given you the ability to get kind of ridiculous with it. Uh, there's, there's 12 tools that you can put on your mouse gestures. Um, I haven't gone there yet. I'm still at eight. But I can click and drag items. If there's a plus symbol, it means that it doesn't have anything assigned to it yet. If I want to put my mass properties on there, I can just click and drag the tool on there. And now when I use my mouse gestures, when I'm in an assembly, if I hold my right mouse button down and move to the left, I'm in my measure tool. Same thing when I'm in the part or uh, drawing. I've got these things set to my shortcut toolbar. So again, uh, I'm a big proponent of using the mouse gestures. They've expanded them a little bit more. All right, let's uh, do a cut with this. Draw both. If I go here, there's my shortcut toolbar, just by right-clicking, going straight down. So that's why I like the mouse gestures. They can bring up stuff. You know, it looks like it's magic, because if you do it fast enough, the mouse gestures don't even appear. But what I'm after here is I want to put in a chamfer. The chamfer has been upgraded. You have your old chamfer friends, the distance and angle, distance and distance, or when you're on a vertex, you can go distance on each leg of the vertex. But they've added these two that act more like our fillet options inside of SOLIDWORKS. If I pick this where I'm saying I want it offset face, so what it's going to do is it's going to calculate the edge of this chamfer a distance from the surfaces. A distance this direction, distance that direction, that's set up right here. When I pick more than one edge, I get this choice for multiple distances. You've probably seen this before inside of the fillet tool where you can create a bunch of fillets at once in one tool. So you can just pick the edges you want and then each edge can be driven by whatever value you put in. You just double click here on the graphic screen or you highlight the edge that you're after and you can change the setting right here. So we can get a pretty crazy looking chamfer there. Another type of chamfer that we've got is one that's face and face. So this is very much, if you guys have ever done the face face fillets, the same command where you pick one face, pick another face, it puts a chamfer in between them. You can set it up to whatever value you want, or as I was saying, they've improved the chamfer to act more like the fillet a fillet, you can use a hold line where I can say, I want the, the chamfer to start here. And so I can get this offset chamfer pretty easily. So it started from that edge that I created with my split line. That's where the chamfer starts. And then it goes up to the other face at whatever angle I type in there. So the ability to create uh, much more robust chamfers. Also, when you are using this tool, if you set it to that offset type or the face-face type, 
when you go into edit the feature, you get this feature type choice. You can actually convert it to a fillet on the fly. So you don't have to get rid of the chamfer and put in a new fillet. Any chamfer that was put in using those tools, I can change to a fillet right away. And it's funny because in 17, when they came up with this, the item would still show as a chamfer on the icon. It still retains the chamfer name, but it does change the icon to a fillet when you toggle that now in 18. So you can see the difference where one's flat and one's rounded or even facing different directions. All right, I'm gonna save this part out. Just wherever, don't really care. Start a new assembly out of it. I'll drop this part in. Hold my control key, drag and drop another file, there we go. Remember my measurement tool? It's right there. If I just go over to the left, when using the mouse gestures, I'm right in there. I wanted to show you was the fact that if you're taking a measurement between two cylinders, you have choices as to whether it's going to go center to center, whether it's going to do the minimum distance, the maximum distance, or you can pick and choose um, where you can have one be min, one be max you know, whatever you want to do. So that's been inside of the measurement tool pretty much forever since that new uh, measurement tool interface came up. But what's new in 18, or maybe 17, sometimes I'm getting confused on this, is when I go to put a distance in between here, I get the same choice on distances. So if I'm putting a distance mate in between cylinders forever, since SOLIDWORKS came out, it's always been a distance between the axes of those cylinders, center to center. <laughs> At this point, now you can do a minimum distance or a maximum distance, or just like in the measurement tool, you can also do a custom where one's min, one's max, however you want to set it up. But that'll be part of that distance mate. When you're inside your... Uh, property manager, you can see you can control it right here underneath the distance dialog. All right, big fun. Here's another really nice one. Um, if you're somebody who does weldments or sheet metal parts. So they gave us a, ta a tab and slot tool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a piece of sheet metal here. And just extrude this out as a piece of metal. I'll put a second part in here. So this works with multi-body parts. Again, you can use it in sheet metal or you can use it in weldments. Um, you can also do this at the assembly level, but it's a lot slicker at the multi-body part level. So I got two pieces of metal that I have got going the wrong direction. First that. All right, so they're, they're sitting right next to each other, but if I actually wanted them to stay like that, I would need to do some sort of fixture, some gusset, something like that, or I can do a tab and, sl and slot. <clears throat> so I'll look up tab and slot. I'll even drop it over onto my toolbar here, and you'll see it looks a lot like a linear pattern sort of setup, where the first thing I need to pick is the direction that the slots are gonna go in. And then the next thing is the face for the slot depth. And you'll see what it's doing. It's putting slots in there for me. I can set up just to be square, 
round off the edges or put a chamfer on the edge. This is where I set up the size of that chamfer. Also, it's going along the entire length at this point. Um, if I just set it up directly, it'll take that whole length and it'll just show me, you know, this is the, uh, the spacing that I've got. And it's just going to take that number and divide it by the length of the line that I drew or the length of the line that I selected. But you can play with it a little more. You can do an offset. So you see, I can have it start 10 millimeters away from the edge of the part. and it'll recalculate what the spacing is on those tabs. And when I'm done, what it does is it puts tabs on one side and slots on the other with the clearance that I specify inside that tab and slot with the chamfers along the top. And you'll see that if I isolate the part, you get a nice way to have those things hold together without me having to screw things into them. Okay, I'm moving uh, pretty fast through this stuff. Let me just check. I, I don't have anybody monitoring my uh, Dory today, so let me just um, check out if I've got any questions in the background here. Let me just um, check out if I've got any questions in the background here. Oop, hey, there it's. I didn't have any uh, questions, but I started hearing myself kind of weirded me out. <laughs> that was the live stream playing. Sorry about that. Uh, of course, this live stream will be recorded and posted for you. And if you if I do miss any questions, I'll try and get to them um, after the presentation. Okay, moving right along. Some more enhancements as far as what we can do inside of SolidWorks. The one thing I've got going is in the drawing. I've got a multiple sheet drawing here and I realize, wow, these are both on an A size piece of paper. We never do A size piece of paper. I got to change these. In the past, it wouldn't be that tough. I just need to go into the sheet, go to properties, switch this to whatever land, whatever size piece of paper I want. What's new is the fact that I can modify a bunch of sheets at once. In the past, what I need to do is I need to go to each individual sheet and change the template there. Here, if I say I'd like to select all the sheets, and I apply changes. Now this one's on a B size. Hey, this one's on a B size as well. So you don't have to go into each sheet to be able to push things like scale or the paper size or the template that you're using. You can group select, push it all to all of the pieces that you were doing. Yes. Is Right. Um, yeah, the question, I'm sorry, the question was, what if you wanted to have it remain a different sheet for sheet one and then just push change sheet two or something like that, change sheet three? What that does is it gives you the option. When I'm in the properties here and I say, which sheets do I want to modify? You just wouldn't check on the one that you want to leave as the original. Sometimes our, our first page has a lot more legalese, it has the tolerance block, all that sort of information. So that's gonna have a different template than sheet two. But if I had multiple sheets twos, I could just push it to all of the second sheets or third sheets, and leave the first sheet alone just by picking and choosing. If you pick this top one, it'll pick them all. Does that answer your question? Okay. 
Some other things on drawings. When you've got a section view, there's the ability to emphasize the outline. You'll see that it, it changed the font on the edge of the part for me, so it's nice and bold. Not a huge change, but something. If you want to see a little bit better what exactly the cutting plane is, you can do that there. Also, another one that uh, I'm not sure who asked for this or why, but it's a thing you can do now. Jaggedy edges. And you can set up how jaggedy are your edges. Um, again, I don't know why you, you want jagged edges on your details, but in 2018, you can certainly do them now. All right, I had one more file that I wanted to open up here. Talk a little bit about the um, new capabilities inside of 18. So for this, I'm going to open up a sketch. I've already got a sketch of our X logo. Hey, what do you know? I will copy that from this part and paste it into this part. I'll move it down here. If I grab this thing by the X in the middle, I can kind of center it up. There we go. So I've got this sketch sitting in the middle of my part. There's different ways that I can get that logo shape onto the front of the boot. I can obviously do a split line or I can extrude, but it's not going to conform to the shape of the, the that surface. It's just going to extrude perpendicularly to my sketch plane, giving it a flat top. Also, it's going to stay this shape throughout. If you wanted to actually wrap that logo onto a curved face, you can do that now. So the tool that I'm going to use is something called wrap, which actually isn't a new tool. It's been around for many, many years. But the thing that is new is this wrap method. This used to be the only method I had right here. We did not have choices there. And if you wanted to go on a surface like this, it would give you this warning that says, you can only wrap on extruded or revolved faces. So when it comes to organic surfaces, I was out of luck. I would have to do things with split lines, create surfaces, thicken them, that kind of thing. If I change this wrap method to a spline on a surface, you'll see I pick it and I can use any surface now. And what it's done is it's taken that shape and it's wrapped it around that organic shape for me. I have three choices I can do when I am doing the wrap. You can either emboss, which makes it come out, deboss, which is also known as engrave, or this last choice that's scribe. And when you do a scribe, all it does is it just breaks up the faces. It's kind of like a split line, where it doesn't actually change the volume. But you see that I can get it to extrude that shape right off of that surface for me automatically. So it saves me a bunch of having to do that manually. Another new thing with creating surfaces, I go into my uh, sketch tool. You know that you can do splines on surfaces. That's not new, but the thing that is new is I can do an offset spline on a surface. And what this does for me, I set the value I want the offset to, I can pick geometry on a surface, and it'll lay down a spline in a 3D sketch on that surface, offset from this. So I'm offsetting, you know, in 3D space. I'm not just offsetting on a 2D sketch. So it really uh, brings out some of the power of, you know, working on a surface. If you just directly have your geometry on a surface like that. I didn't know if you know that you can do this, but you can extrude a 3D sketch. You just have to tell it 
uh, what direction it's going to go in. Once I say a direction of pull, there we go. I can create a surface. Now that's coming directly off of that surface. So a little bit on modeling. Using some of the new tools, being able to wrap, paste, things like that. Okay. Here's one more thing that I have to give caveats on, just like I had to give you a little pre-warning on not upgrading to 18 just because you can. You need to check with all of the people in your group to make sure that they're all going to go to 18 at the same time. So are your vendors and suppliers so that you don't have anybody saving to a file type that other people can't open. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to go through is talking about an enhancement that's in EPDM. So this is in EPDM 2018. You can do it inside of SOLIDWORKS 2016. You do not need to upgrade your software, your modeling software to do this. It's completely within EPDM, and we already updated to EPDM 18 last week. So this tool is called Branch and Merge. And the caveat I want to say is that uh, Loon, you can't do this. In fact, they don't want you to do it so much that they actually took the tool out of your interface where you're not even going to be able to access it if you're in the Loon vault. I'm in the proxy vault um, in this example that I'm showing here. So I still do have the tool. And the tool that I'm talking about is this branch and merge. What this gives you the ability to do is you can take an existing design and you can create iterations of files and work on them without affecting the original. And then when you're satisfied that your new uh, choice is what you want, you can push it back into the design. So let me show you. I'm going to right click on uh, this part and choose to branch it. You have to give a branch name, new gripper. You also have to give it a new name. So what it's going to do is it's going to create another SLD PRT for me because I'm only doing this for a single part. You can do it at the subassembly level. What this is doing basically is it's creating a copy, sort of like when you do copy tree in EPDM, if any of you have ever done that. You can do copy tree. That will give you a new version to work on. You can work on it. And the trick that people would do is they would rename it to the original name and then drop it on top of it. This allows you, this streamlines it and makes it something where you don't have to sort of hack it like what I'm talking about here. Uh, you can do it, you know, above board, keeping all of the, uh, the history and everything like that. So it needs a new name. See how branch is not available for me yet until I choose to either name it with a prefix or a suffix. So if you want to call it dash A, dash B, dash C, you can do that. Or you can just give it a new number, the next number off the list in your vault. You'll see that now that I've chosen to give it a serial number, branch is now a choice. Also, it allows me to check in right afterwards. And it'll create this branch for me. So it's creating a copy of the file. It's giving it a new name and it's putting it into my Vault. Um. Let me go up a level. Come back in here, see if it's updated. There we go. Here's the new part that it created for me. Um, when I go into my tools, remember how I had to give it a name when I chose to do a branch and I called it the new gripper? I can go to a part that's part of a branch 
and it'll show me associated branches. You can do more than one of these. So if you've got like a group of a dozen people and three or four of you have ideas, you can branch each of you, create your own branch and work on them independently. And then when it comes time, you can choose who gets to merge it. But this allows me to see, you know, how many branches is this part associated with? It gets even stickier when you start getting into like subassembly branching and things like that. But I'm just going to try and keep it simple here. So it created this part for me that I want to make changes to. I don't really like the, uh, the two finger idea here. Um, I'm going to try something else. So I'll create an axis. Go in here and do a circular pattern around that axis. Equal spacing. Get three or four of these, depending on which one I want to go with. Take a look at how that looks. So as I save it, I can check it in. It's going to keep its own revision history. And so now you'll see this one is on Rev 2. Let me go into this. And sort this by assemblies. Here's where that gripper is used. So if I open this assembly up, we'll take a look at what's going on here. I don't really need to check it out. I just need to take a look at what's going on with it. There we go. You'll see that this is still the same old part, the original 690 that I had in there. It's not the branch part that I did. But I wanted to call to your attention that this is version number 36 of this hand. So it's been going for a while. And remember, I branched out, and my branch only has version 2 right now. So the branch can keep its own history as you're going through, making changes, whatever you want to do. Once you're satisfied with whatever changes you wanted to do, you can pick on this part and have the ability to merge it. So I'll give them some idea of what I just changed in there. I can merge this. So it's putting it back into my vault. And what it's doing is doing a couple things in the background. The original does not disappear. Or the original branch that I created, I can still go in here and make more changes and merge it again later. So it's not one thing that once you've merged it back in, you got to branch it back out again. Once you've branched it, you can continually merge it back in, making it however many changes you want. Um, so it's a really good design tool for iterations, and again, it keeps the history of everything. So now when I go into this assembly and I open it up, it's going to need to rebuild, and when it does, hey, it's got four fingers now. It's still the same file name, but instead of version 36, this is version 37. So you can take your branch out, you can manipulate it however you want, keep a whole history of it, say, okay, I want to put it in. It'll drop it back into your original assembly with the old part name just as a new version of it. So it's a really huge step forward as far as iterating designs where you can have a bunch of people working on different options for your design. And once you've got a winner, you can merge that back in. Um, 
Again, Loon, they don't want you doing this because you're going to be going to Anovia soon and they don't want to have branches hanging out in space. For people on Proxy or any of the other vaults, you do have the option to do this. You are going to want to think ahead if you are going to start using this branch and merge. And then later on, there comes a time when you're going to want to translate your data over to something like Anovia. You're going to want to merge all those branches before you leave uh, just to kind of clean things up because that link will be gone if you change systems. So is the old part still in a vault somewhere or is it kind of like disappeared? Okay, so the question was, is the old part still in the vault? This is the old part that I'm looking at right now. So if I open up this file, it's just exactly when I go to, if I go to the get list, this is where it was before I branched out. This is where it is when I merged it back in. So it overrides the file. I mean, does it say in the history that we did that between 36 and 37? No, the history is just going to be whatever comment you put in there. So my comment was added fingers. It'll, it'll show you that. But it has no idea that you did it through a branch and merge. That's not, that isn't captured. Um, if you do like this, there's a chance that there's going to be like a lot of different configurations all over vaults in some sense and kind of substitute it in and out. Okay, so, so the question was... Uh, can't this get a little convoluted when you're dealing with different configurations and things like that? Or if you're, uh, it does. Especially, uh, I was telling you with the subassembly, uh, when you say, okay, I want to branch this subassembly, it makes a copy of every single part in that assembly. You can monkey with each part that you want. When you go to merge it, you pick and choose which parts are going to override the originals. So you do have to kind of have a, a, a grasp on what's going on as far as changes. So it can get convoluted. If you have a bunch of people working on a, mer or a branch at the same time, you kind of want to keep communication open as to what's going on. If you're adding new parts, what's going on, so that when you merge it, you know to put all the files that you're supposed to back into the original. So it, it isn't, uh, you know, it isn't a completely carefree <laughs> kind of tool. You can certainly uh, get into places that that you didn't. Think about if you are using multiple configurations, if you're doing it at the subassembly level, uh, you're going to have to think about it, map out exactly who's, who's going to be working on what and how it changes. Okay. Um, let's see. What else? I'm sorry. Did that answer your question? Okay, so that's one huge thing inside of the design tool that is the branch merge. The other huge thing is something called uh, topology simulation. And before I do it, I have to remember, because this one got me, it took me several days to figure out what was going on. In order to run a topology study, you need to run SolidWorks as an administrator. If it, it has to do with where the file is written to. So there's no way around this that you need to, if you're going to do a topology, you need to um, right click and open SolidWorks as an administrator. And then you'll be able to do this trick. Uh, I didn't find that written anywhere. Luckily, Charlie Saint was able to get an answer for me on it. And if I do it as an administrator, there's no problem with it. But if, if you find it says it can't write to a file location, it'll drop right out of the topology instantly. It says I can't write to this and you're shut down. If that's the case, what you need to do is run as administrator. So while I'm opening this, I did forget one other thing that's new in 18. Up here, I can um, log out or log in. To my SolidWorks. As long as I get my info right here, that logs me in. Why do I need to be logged in? They're starting to move SOLIDWORKS. The idea is that someday CAD's all going to be on the cloud. And so they're trying to put 
more stuff onto the cloud. When I'm logged in, I have the ability to check in or check out licenses. Not a huge deal for most of the users at Google because we use a license manager where you can check out a license if you're going to be off the network or if you are a full-time employee, you can VPN in and get your license from there. But for people that have standalone licenses, if they want to use it at the computer at work, they have to turn, if they're done, they want to go home and use it too, they have to turn in their license at work and then go home and activate that license. With this login, you can activate your license real time, sort of like on the cloud. You just go in, you can turn off one machine, turn on another machine without, without having to physically be at that machine. Um, also, you're able to set save your settings over there. So if you've got shortcut keys and things like that, you can actually store these in your My SolidWorks. And when you log in, it'll push those settings onto the computer that you're in. OK. Um, now, back to what, where was I going with this? I was going to turn in, turn on SOLIDWORKS simulation. So with SOLIDWORKS simulation turned on, this needs to get me a license here. There we go, simulation tab comes up. I'm gonna create a study with basic SOLIDWORKS, I can create static studies pretty easily. Tell it what it's made out of. Fix some geometry, so that's where my bolt holes go in. Add loads. We can mesh and run. And for this type of analysis, you do not need to check it out as administrator. It'll do fine on this. But why I'm running this simulation is to show you that this part's way stronger than it needs to be. So the yield strength down here at the bottom with the red arrow at 2.4 is nowhere near the max strength of, what is that, 1.57. So this thing's over-designed. I don't need this much material. And a lot of us work on things where weight is crucial. So what the new simulation tool can do for us, if I go and create a new study, there's a new type of study called a topology study. It starts out pretty much the same way, where I can put in fixtures and loads. So again, there's where the bolts hold on. Here's the downward force. But instead of just meshing and running it this time, I already know how strong it is. What the topology allows me to do is I can say, what am I shooting for? What do I want to make better about this geometry? That's in this controls where, I'm sorry, in the goals. So if you wanna make it so it doesn't move quite as much as far as the displacement, or minimize the mass uh, of the constraint, or with this one, I'm looking for relatively as stiff as you can get using half of the weight. So they have different abilities, different ways that you can set up what your goal is. And for this, I just this, think this thing's too heavy. So I want to take off. We can cut this thing in half probably. But I don't even know exactly where to start cutting. A couple more things I need to tell it. Preserved regions. I need to tell it you don't get rid of these. You definitely need these. We also, I would like this hole and that face. Leave those alone. Now, this is going to take quite some time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mesh it first. Maybe it'll take a little less time if I 
lower the mesh on this. And then I can run this topology. It's going to take a long time. What it does is first it, it runs the, th the test through, and then it's going to start iterating. It's going to start trying to remove material, run the test again, remove some more material, run the test, until it gets a convergence of this is the most amount of material I can remove before you start losing your strength. So you'll see it's at 3% now. It's going to be a while. So while we're waiting, I'll talk about some of the stuff that I said I wasn't going to demonstrate live. This is some of the stuff that's uh, more on the marketing or on the products that work with SOLIDWORKS instead of the functionality inside SOLIDWORKS itself. eDrawings has been improved in the past couple of years. Uh, it, you can embed MBD information. So far, we are not using MBD. And the main reason is the inspection tool and the MBD which stands for model-based definition, if you guys aren't sure. Basically what it does is it attaches your datums and your tolerances to the model so that when you send somebody the model, they know your intent as far as how you want this thing specced out as for the tolerances. When you send somebody an e-drawing, you can choose to send that DIM expert information that shows where the important tolerances are, where the GD&T, where is your datums, all that sort of stuff. Also, um, decals. Earlier, if you had a decal and you sent somebody an e-drawing with a decal in it, you needed to send that PNG or that bitmap or whatever your decal was along with the e-drawing for them to see it. Now it embeds the decal in there. Also, when you are sending uh, MBD or inspection information, you can have information per configuration as far as how you want the tolerancing to go. Some other new things, Visualize. Visualize is the standalone renderer. There's two renderers inside of SOLIDWORKS. One is PhotoView 360, which is gold level, meaning it runs within SOLIDWORKS. It's on the right-hand side. You can drag and drop stuff. You never leave SOLIDWORKS. Visualize is a separate program where you import your SOLIDWORKS information into currently. Someday, it'll be inside SOLIDWORKS. They're still perfecting it because it's got a, a much different engine than the PhotoView 360 did. It's, it's using your uh, graphical processing unit a lot more. Uh, so it's sort of like a real-time renderer. The longer you leave it sitting, the crisper the image gets. What's happened in Visualize? Again, you can bring in decals pretty easily, which they claimed they could do when they first put Visualize out, but it was not true. You, the decals would get messed up. Now they're good at bringing the decals in. There is different levels to visualize. Visualize can also be used to make animations. Basically, in your assembly, you make a motion study inside of SOLIDWORKS, and you can port that motion study out to visualize to render each frame of your movie. Uh, you need to have a pro license. We don't have a lot of those. And also, if you've ever used the motion manager, it is pretty rough on making animations. So maybe not the best one for you. With regular Visualize, however, they do have the ability to export out as virtual reality images. So these, uh, as you see in this picture here, it's the stereoscopic type of thing where you've got two pictures, you put it into a Google Cardboard or any other type of VR headset, and it looks like it's in 3D. So you can render things in 3D, send somebody a VR picture, they put the VR picture, they can move around, they can see what you've designed, either just a component, or in this picture, they've actually, it's a camper that they're doing. So you're standing inside the camper and they took a picture so you can uh, actually do a panoramic save as well so they can look around and see spatially what your design looks like. I'll be more excited when they do move Visualize actually into SOLIDWORKS. Some other things just on the basic SOLIDWORKS side. Mesh. If you're bringing in uh, OBJ files or scans, either somebody has made something in like a 3D Studio Max, some sort of artistic program, uh, you can bring in mesh files or from scanners often will bring in mesh files. Before, if you had a mesh file, you really couldn't do anything with it until you turned it into surfaces or solids using uh, 
the using an add-in inside SolidWorks. Oh, hey, that one's done. Okay, I'll be right back to that. Now you can bring in that mesh geometry, sort of like I brought in the step file. I don't have to translate it. I can just bring that mesh file in. I can mate to mesh faces. I can copy and, or move mesh bodies around. So you can manipulate the stuff a little bit more without having actually having to translate it in scan to 3D. That's the name of the add-in I was looking for. Also, trying to keep up with the Joneses here, a couple of years ago, a competitor of SolidWorks called Autodesk put CAM into their Fusion 360 tool and caused quite a stir because you could get CAM for not a lot of money. So SolidWorks has put in a basic CAMWorks inside of 2018. So you don't need to have any special licenses. It comes with SolidWorks. We don't do a lot of machining from the engineering side. Usually we send it down to the design kitchen or a vendor. But what this does is it'll create tool paths for you. You can set up what you have in your uh, crib as far as the tools you're using, and then it'll try and take a guess as to what paths you should use. You can edit those and then shoot the code out to a mill or a lathe. It is, I believe, only two and a half D. If you want to get like a really complex mill working on it, you have to buy the full version. Another thing, and they, they kind of made a big deal of this, a 17, but when I've looked at it, it's a pretty limited tool. It's called a magnetic mate. They have something called mate references where you can already set up like a, if, if you've got a USB port, for example, you can set up a type of mate where stuff automatically snaps into USB ports correctly, where it's centered, snapped up along it. Magnetic mates allow you to do the same thing. You have to open the part, precede it with information of how it's going to mate to things, and then you're able to drop it in quickly. You'll see the picture in the lower right of this shows a layout. The layout is really the only place that I've seen a good idea. What they were able to do is you could drop in different sections of conveyor belt and it would snap right to it. The thing is, is we don't use a lot of modular things here. We're doing a lot of R&D where it's one-offs or a particular design that doesn't always snap together the same way. So if we start building stuff out of Legos, we might want to revisit the magnetic mates, but for now, um, it looks like a lot more setup than it's worth. Uh, here's another teaser. I told you you could use the merge and branch in any EPDM vault except for Loon. There's another thing that's been a big step forward as far as EPDM, and that is the rev block getting connected to your EPDM. The thing is, is that this needs to be set up and tested in our vaults before we can run it. It's not something that comes out of the box. You have to set up what information is relevant. What are you calling it revision? Are you calling it rev? Are you calling it checked by with a space or no space? You have to set up the variables that it's looking for. And what it'll do is you fill out the data card with your ECO, with your description of change, with the date, maybe checked by. When you go to push it into a new workflow, It'll take that information from the data card and populate your rev block with it. If it has not been released, you can have it put a placeholder like an asterisk that will sit in your rev block. And then once the thing is released, that'll change to a real number like an A or a B, a one or a two, whatever revision scheme you're using for your project, it'll write it into there. So you truly have a link. But again, if you wanna check that out, you're going to have to talk to uh, myself or Monty, maybe Charlie Saint or uh, John Tran as to setting your vault up with the specific variables that you want in your data card that get pushed to the rev block. But it is something that at least now we have the ability to. I'd love to see it set up because I do a lot of drawing changes myself and I'm constantly filling that information out. It'd be nice to fill it out in one spot and just have it automatically populate. All right, and uh, new simulation stuff, there's a lot more mesh control, the ability to combine and split up meshes, move and copy or cut them with surfaces or interference check inside of your mesh. You can also save the mesh out as a solid, which takes me back to SolidWorks. 
Okay, so this thing is half as heavy as the old part and still can hold the same weight. But wow, that's really not smooth. It's, it's the way it's doing it, they used to have an optimize inside SOLIDWORKS where you could lock on to parametric dimensions and say, hey, this thing can get thicker, this can get thinner, this can get longer. You'd have to set up dimensions that it was able to change and then it would try and get you the optimal shape playing around with the parametric dimensions. What the topography study does is it breaks down that mesh and then starts removing mesh pieces for you and seeing if they are critical or not. So it's mesh based rather than parametric information. So the finer your mesh, the finer these little chunks that it's taking out are going to be. But it's always going to have this sort of weird wobbly look to it where it's giving you an idea of, OK, I can take a lot of stuff out of here. I can also chop this inside out without having to worry about this. Maybe taper this. That's the places where I can save weight. It hasn't changed the part for me. It's just given me a visual on what it looks like. Now, in the past, it was kind of rough on getting this information from, OK, this is what the simulation has told me. How do I get that into geometry that I can use? So here's the new thing. You see right now, I just have a single configuration. What I want to do here is I want to export this mesh. So now you can save meshes out. And it's not just on this topology, on any simulation. So if I did a stress and strain, I could shoot out that color-coded mesh out as a solid, send it to somebody in e-drawing. They can actually see what it looks like um, in 3D. So I'm going to save this as a new configuration. And so far, this has happened to me every time. And that is, I have to get out of this and jump back in for it to actually do the trick correctly. So I say, okay, let's export the smooth meshes as a new configuration. I want it as solid geometry. And now it's working, I can see, because I got the little timer, the, the blue circle. So there we go. Now I've got, this is my original config. And this is a solid showing me what I can get away with as far as making this as light as it can be and still being able to hold that uh, 1,000 Newtons. So I can use, now I can use this, I can take this geometry and sort of use it as a real view as to what I can cut away and chop at. Um, you know, I can sketch on these faces and things like that where I would not be able to do that if it was just a result from the simulation. All right, so that was the stuff that's really crucial in 17 and 18. If you are thinking about upgrading, you might want to take these new features into account. Again, you don't have to rush. There's no reason to leave 7, 16 uh, until the whole project is ready to do so. But since we do have the option to do it now, you, maybe you wanted to take a look at upgrading, I figured I'd show you what's new. So that's 